And thank you everyone for coming today. This is our kickoff to the Springs Events and Topics in Bioenergy. Um, I thought maybe we, since we were trying a different format this time, we've done sort of formal lecture style. And this time we wanted to really encourage people to talk and ask questions, be a little more informal. I think I'm hearing an echo on there too. I might want to, I don't want to do that. But anyway, so we want to really encourage people to talk and be um, be comfortable in, in maybe not a lecture style hall. So uh, maybe we could just, if everyone could maybe just say where they, uh, if they're undergrad, if they're staff, so we all know each other. I think most of each other. I'm Bob Lankachip, I'm a faculty member. I'm Rachel Girola, I'm an outreach coordinator for PARC. I'm Jennifer Hill, I'm a Energy, environmental, and chemical engineering. Uh, Lynn uh, in AC, page two. Okay. I wrote ESGs for the engineering. Okay. I'm Chris Chairman, I'm a staff of research professional advisor. I'm Jeanette Bush, I'm a research scientist at Ursula Good Health Club. I'm Chad Dean, a staff member with iCares. Hi, I'm Suzanne Louie, I'm a staff with iCares. And I'm Natalie Goodwin Frank, I uh, work for iCares, which is a um, center run by Bob Lankinship. Um, yes, my partner. You said I care. Oh, I said I care. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny. <it's> <laughs> I have to correct you on that one now. No, that, that's too big to let go. <laughs> For PARC, the Photosynthetic Antenna Research Center. All right, so um, I just wanted to also let everyone know if you're interested. There is um, another event on February 21st. Come on in. Hey, Liz. Hi. Um, at Schlafly Bottle Works, we just learned about this, and this is uh, a kickoff to the Missouri Coalition uh, for the Environment's initiative to bring people for to lobby uh, at the state capitol. Which so the the uh, rally day is uh, February 21st at Schlafly Bottle Works from 6:30 to 9 o'clock. We've got that posted on our website, and then the uh, day that they're going to lobby at the state capitol is February 29th. And there, if you're interested in going, they do have carpools. I saw that one. So. Um, for they're just lobbying. They've got a variety of issues: of sustainable local agriculture, clean energy, green schools, things like that. So it's all policy. Um, also, uh, we are planning as part of the events and topics series uh, two tours. This in uh, March and April. We're going to the Missouri Botanical Garden, and we're also planning a trip to Tyson Research Center. So please stay tuned for those. They will be scheduled very soon. And we'll all, that will probably conclude our spring events and topics series, and we'll continue in the fall again as we did last year. And today we are pleased to welcome Mr. Mark Henson. He is adjunct faculty member in EECE and also a PhD candidate. He has a wealth of industry experience. He's worked for Associated British Foods, Petrolite, and DuPont in a variety of different capacities from Director of Environmental Health and Safety um, to um, Environmental uh, Management. He has a Bachelor's Degree in Chemical Engineering from Cooper Union as well as a Master's Degree in Chemical Engineering from Carnegie Mellon. So with that, I am pleased. Thank you again, Mark, yep. for joining us today in My our pleasure. new setting and our experiment, as you said. I'll turn it over to you. Thank, Thank you very much. <clears throat> Well, thank you everyone for coming out today, and happy Valentine's. Um, as you can see from my title slide, uh, the main topic I'm going to be talking about today is some computational modeling work I've been doing on uh, the production of microalgal biodiesel. Uh, but before I get deep into making biodiesel from algae, uh, talk a little bit about me and how I got to where I am now, uh, standing in front of you talking about this topic. Uh, a little bit of background information on biofuels in general, and then get into a discussion of producing biodiesel specifically from single cell algae, and what's motivating the work. Uh, the tool that I'm working on, which I call the Telsim, for lack of a better name, we'll come up with something a little catchier, I think, uh, as we get a little further along. But I'll talk about the model and how it's structured, the process model uh, in terms of uh, how we actually propose to make the fuel from algae, and uh, how we've gone about populating the model initially, what I call the test scenario, and uh, what we propose to do with the model uh, once it's done. So uh, I had a little bit of an introduction. Natalie, thank you very much. Uh, 
not much more I wanted to add to that uh, to say that uh, my initial interest uh, when I was in school was in polymer and polymer chemistry. Uh, went to work for the biggest polymer manufacturer in the world, and of course throughout my career at DuPont, never did anything remotely related to polymers. Um, I spent time at uh, several manufacturing sites on the Gulf Coast, where in fact they do make polymer intermediates, um, and it was around that time, uh, the, primarily the middle 80s, when the chemical industry was becoming subject to a lot of new uh, regulation that flowed from the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, to the Resource Conservation Recovery Act. Um, and I was charged with trying to help these factories figure out how they were going to manage waste streams that previously had been simply discharged into the environment. So that began my transition into the environmental field. <clears throat> uh, developed some innovative technologies which the company uh, was interested in seeing whether or not there was any potential market for. So I was moved from the Gulf Coast up to the company headquarters in Delaware. Uh, found out that there wasn't a big enough business potential for DuPont's taste. Uh, and then worked in a couple of other environmental businesses that DuPont runs, including a commercial hazardous waste treatment business in New Jersey and an external environmental management consulting business. Uh, it was then in 1993 I was recruited away to come work in St. Louis for a mid-sized specialty chemical company called Petrolite. And uh, I was the director of uh, environment, health, and safety for them until they were acquired by a competitor. And naturally, they already had someone who did my job. Uh, and then I was uh, hired by Fleischmann's Yeast a little bit later to do essentially the same thing for them. And then in 2002, uh, my boss, Vice President of Manufacturing, retired and I uh, was promoted to take his place. I ran that department for about four or five years until Fleischmann's was acquired by another company. And once again, I found myself on the outside looking in. And it was around that time that I met Mary Sansaloni, then Dean of the Engineering School, who invited me, enticed me, uh, to come back to school, uh, both to teach and uh, to pursue a PhD in uh, energy, environmental, and chemical engineering. Um, my interest is particularly in the area of energy. I think it's a, a really worthwhile topic, especially for someone like me who's kind of looking at the tail end of their career. When I think about issues that are really important Middle career, thank you. That's what I, and that could be in the academic environment, I could probably extend it uh, a lot longer than I could in industry. Um, but when I look at the landscape today, look at our situation kind of on a global basis, I, I really am concerned about the nexus of energy and environment and our seeming unabatable addiction to cheap fossil fuels. And it makes a lot of sense to think about biofuels as an alternative to fossil fuels. If you think about it in the most uh, abstract and simplest terms, the carbon is absorbed out of the atmosphere, it's converted into biomass, we harvest and burn that biomass, the carbon is simply released back into the atmosphere, and it's a beautiful natural cycle, right? No accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But this is really an oversimplistic way of looking at biofuels. There's something very important missing from this flow chart. And it has to do with this activity down here at the bottom, this harvesting activity. Because there can be energy associated with the mere act of collecting, processing, and transporting the biofuel. Right? So there could be carbon emissions associated with these activities that's not reflected in this closed loop cycle. Now another way to look at this, I, I took these charts from some work that's being done um, at the Argonne National Laboratory. They're doing a lot of work on transportation fuels. And this captures a little bit more uh, explicitly this indirect energy consumption associated with the production of fuels. So what you're looking at here is how much energy does it take to produce a given amount of energy in the form of a liquid transportation fuel. On the left-hand side, we're looking at corn ethanol, and on the right-hand side, a <coughs> conventional fossil fuel, um, a diesel-type fuel, right? And you look at, you say, wow, you know, this only takes three-quarters of a million BTUs of fossil fuel input to produce a million BTUs of ethanol, whereas we're looking at a substantially larger amount to produce an equivalent amount of energy in the form of a petrofuel. I tend to look at this a little bit differently. So imagine a scenario where rather than 
bringing in some external source of energy to drive these processes, what if I was to take some of the fuel that I produced and use that as my energy source to cover these expenses, so to speak? Well, think about it. I've used three quarters of a million BTUs of the million BTUs that I produced to produce that. So you go back to the corn, in essence, I'm, I'm using the energy content of three bushels of corn to get the energy out of the fourth, right? So it's a rather low yielding process. If you actually do the math on this side, it's around 18%, and that's actually quite high. Uh, other fossil fuels, depending on the amount of processing that has to be done, the, the transportation distance can be well less than 10% of the fuel energy to uh, cover the processing costs. This is a chart that shows a variety of energy sources from the same perspective. The energy return on investment, in other words, how much usable energy do I get divided by the amount of chemical energy, non-sunlight energy, uh, required to produce that amount of fuel. And you can see things like hydro and fossil fuels that have pretty high ratios of the amount of energy returned for the amount of energy required to process and produce and transport those fuels. And you can see where biofuels tend to fall. I'm pretty low uh, in terms of this ratio. And there is actually a very important breakpoint, a threshold for this value, this energy return on investment or net energy return. And that's one to one. Right? Think about it. If this number, the energy return on investment, is less than one, it means I'm getting less energy out of the fuel that I produce than the energy I had to put into it to produce it in the first place. So I go back to my scenario before where I'm using part of my fuel to cover the energy cost associated with producing the fuel. If this ratio is less than one, there's no way I can even cover the cost of producing the fuel in the first place. And when I say cost, I mean energy input required. Now another aspect uh, similar to this energy issue is carbon. And carbon is going to essentially have a similar sort of behavior as energy. So what I've shown here is a study that I did where we're looking at a uh, coal-fired 500 megawatt plant, electric power plant near Kansas City. And the study was to take 10% of the coal away and replace it with a biofuel to see what would happen, right? And as you can see from the combustion side, again, if we assume that on the combustion side, the carbon is closed loop, right? So there's no net carbon emissions compared to the amount of carbon released by the coal. What I want you to look at here is a comparison of the production and transportation carbon emissions from producing and moving coal. And in this particular case, the coal that this power plant is using is from the Powder River Basin, it's very clean coal, in Wyoming, about 1,000 miles away from the power plant where it's being burned to produce electricity, whereas the wood pellets that that uh, coal is being replaced by is all produced locally with forest residue right, in the five counties surrounding the power plant. Yet, even though the transportation distance is so much lower, look at the magnitude of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with producing and transporting these, these two fuels, roughly three times as much. Right? So these are just a couple of things I want you to think about. Um, I've also, just for the sake of uh, education here, the incremental cost, wood pellets are considerably more expensive than coal. If I took the uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction and spread that over the, the incremental cost, the equivalent value of a ton of CO2 equivalent emissions reduction is about uh, over $110. So in other words, I would have to have a subsidy or a carbon tax of that magnitude for this to financially break even, or if I took that cost and spread it over the cost of the electricity and passed that price or cost along to consumers, it would raise the price of electricity by about 10%. So a 10% substitution of coal with a biofuel leads to a 10% increase in price of electricity. So Mark, what's the source of the high production the Processing wood pellets is actually a pretty uh, intensive process. <clears throat> so it's the collection of the material and then the formation of these pellets by uh, pressing. Right? Uh, so it's a rather energy intensive process just in the collection of this very diffuse dispersed material 
and then running it through the process to produce a fuel that is compatible with current combustion technology. This 10% limit is actually imposed by the coal plant itself. To go beyond a 10% substitution would involve significant capital investment at the coal plant to accommodate an alternative fuel. And the reason you say zero on combustion is just because that is yeah, because we're neutral, we're, you're assuming correct. that that's been taken yeah. out of the atmosphere in the years during which the, during which the wood grew. However, there's an interesting coal. Just to, let me follow yeah. up one more time. And the coal line there is is that just 10 percent, or is that, that the, is just the 10 percent, 90 percent, or no? No, that's, this is just the 10 percent that's being replaced. Oh. So, so your the net one to one gain is 290. What million? Uh, 290,000. Uh, metric tons per year of CO2 equivalent, uh, greenhouse gas emission or warming potential, right? So yeah, clearly you, there's a major... You get a major benefit. You get a major benefit, right? Right. Uh, neglecting this small detail. So I, I got a couple of points I want you to think about as we talk about biofuels. <laughs> Typically biofuels have a pretty low net energy return. Uh, the material is often dispersed, has to be collected, and oftentimes has to be processed in some way to make it a compatible fuel with our current uh, power generation technologies. Carbon neutrality really only applies to the combustion and not to the total life cycle of the fuel. And these indirect emissions can be quite significant. Um, Another th aspect of burning biomass, and particularly when it comes to wood, is something I think we were just about to begin to talk about, is that, there, in essence, burning biomass can create a carbon debt because you're burning it, all the carbon is being released, and then how long does it take to regrow whatever the biomass was that contained that carbon, right? So all the emissions occur up front, and then depending on the cycle time for the crop, and wood being obviously one of the worst, because it takes so long to, to regrow the biomass and put it in a position where we have, again, regained neutrality, right? So it's neutral kind of if we neglect the time dependency of the combustion versus the production of the biomass. And then finally, there's, uh, depending on the energy content and the type of fuel, uh, it can involve a really significant amount of land area to produce a meaningful amount of biofuel that would replace our uh, current uh, dependence on fossil fuels. So nothing that I've said changes the fact that clearly we need some alternative to fossil fuels. And given the modes of transportation that we rely on today, um, these are gonna be typically liquid transportation fuels, right? So I can't put a battery in an airplane, not yet anyway, right? Maybe I could have a battery and have an electric car, but it's a little bit hard for me to imagine that we can do away with liquid transportation fuels for all modes of transportation that we rely upon uh, in our society today. Biofuels may be a very uh, significant and appropriate part of the mix of fuels that we rely on in the future. We're already committing substantially to corn ethanol and vegetable oil uh, as a precursor for a biodiesel. So then the logical question is, is microalgae and biofuels derived from microalgae also a potential option to our uh, dependence on uh, fossil fuels? Uh, this is from a review article that focused in on why uh, microalgal biofuels might be a really attractive alternative to the first generation biofuels. And one of the big controversies about corn ethanol and vegetable oil uh, derived diesel is that you're creating competition between food and fuel, right? So the same land area that's used to grow crops that could potentially feed people, we're proposing to divert into production of fuel. And this is at a time when there's still a substantial population in this world that goes hungry. Right? So one of the advantages of microalgae is that it can be farmed on non-arable land, so it doesn't compete with the valuable uh, alternative products, food, fodder, fiber, and other things that we derive from natural crops. Algae are very productive organisms. Some species have doubling times of less than 24 hours. It can be produced year-round. So the yield that one might expect from a given plot of land uh, with algae is substantially higher than with other forms uh, of 
terrestrial crops. Um, algae can also use degraded water. Uh, some algae are marine uh, species, so they can grow in saline water. So uh, an advantage potentially of algae over other terrestrial crops is that it doesn't put the same stress on fresh water supplies. Uh, nutrients can be derived from that wastewater um, or degraded water, and algae can accept uh, CO2 in a concentrated form, such as a flue gas from a power plant or a cement kiln or other forms of industry, whereas terrestrial plants, we rely on passive absorption of CO2 from the atmosphere. Now, while there are some perceived advantages, there are also some pretty significant challenges associated with microalgal biofuels. Not the least of which is that unlike conventional agriculture, um, producing algae is really going to be a much more highly engineered operation. Right? It's not simply putting seed in the ground and letting nature take care of it for us. Uh, these systems are going to be large, capital intensive, and as it turns out, could be uh, rather energy intensive in and of themselves. And unfortunately, there are no large scale commercial biofuel from algae operations in existence yet. So we don't have any benchmarks where we can go out and say, yes, it can be done at this cost with this energy penalty and this carbon footprint. So it's really unproven yet. Now there are a lot of ways that algae could conceivably be converted into a fuel. I've shown uh, some of them here. And the one I'm the most interested in and my work is focused on is this one down at the bottom. Uh, essentially, we're going to grow algae, extract the lipid fraction, primarily in the form of triacylglycerides, and then transesterify them with methanol to produce what is essentially a drop-in uh, transportation fuel that can substitute almost directly for uh, petroleum diesel. Now, algae, as I said, is not grown yet at commercial scale for the production of fuels, but it is grown for the production of some specialty chemicals. Uh, primarily nutraceuticals, but beta carotene, omega fatty acids, and other similar high value nutraceutical compounds are produced commercially using algae. And as I also mentioned, biodiesel is currently being produced from vegetable oil. So we know that from an engineering standpoint, we should be able to link these two together. And I think it's a safe assumption that commercial scale biodiesel production from algae is technically feasible. But if that's the case, then there are some really important questions that we need to ask about the viability of such a process. Yes, it may be feasible, but what's its energy return? How much will biodiesel for microalgae cost? And what are its environmental footprints, uh, namely carbon and water? Now, I'm clearly not the first person to ask these questions. There's been a lot of work, and in fact, an explosion of research in the area of microalgal fuels in the last 10 years. And I've shown the results of some published information that was uh, from which I could calculate what the net energy return of algal oil. So in this case, the product was just the lipid content, the lipid fraction of the microalgae hadn't been all the way converted to biodiesel. But what I want to press upon you is the range of values that one will find in the open literature for the net energy return. You can see that the values cover two orders of magnitude, and not only that, but they straddle this really critical threshold that I mentioned before, that value of one, which is the break point for the net energy return, where less than one, the energy content of the fuel is less than the amount of energy I had to put in to produce it in the first place. Um, what I have here are some costs for the same product, this oil product, that's been uh, taken from uh, the uh, literature, this is a review article uh, recently published where the author was trying to reconcile why are people coming up with such different values for what would ostensibly be the same product. Right? And uh, there's another report, uh, not referenced in this particular review article, but which I've relied on pretty heavily in my work, where a single author reported a value <clears throat> for the production cost of algal oil spanning an entire order of magnitude in and of itself from one uh, reference. And the reason for this very wide range is this author took credit for the fact that if wastewater was used as a source of uh, supplemental water to help close the water balance and nutrients, that that would significantly reduce the cost because in essence you would get paid 
for treating the wastewater, right? So that's the credit that's being applied there. And that's how it can be so cheap. But in essence, this facility was sized to treat wastewater, not to produce biofuel. So it was a very small facility uh, relative to what we would need to produce a meaningful amount of biofuel. Now, why are these wide ranges in values? Well, when you dig into it, you begin to see that these are fairly complicated analyses with a very large number of parameters and assumptions that have to be made in order to generate those sorts of numbers on carbon footprint and cost and energy uh, demand. Uh, different algal species were used, different processing schemes, different scales of operations, different inputs and outputs and system boundaries and so on and so forth. So it's very hard to look at the literature and say, is this viable or not? Is this attractive or competitive or not? And that provides a pretty powerful motivation to provide some single tool with which all of these different parameters can be investigated and probed to determine which are the ones that are really driving cost and environmental impact and so forth, right? So what we're trying to do is develop a tool that we can systematically evaluate all the options that might uh, present themselves, including the biology, the engineering, and the economics, right? so that we can identify what are the key performance metrics and make sure that our energies and our R&D efforts are focused on the things that can really make a difference, right? We don't want to spend our limited resources working on things that really aren't going to change the uh, environmental impact or cost or uh, energy footprint of uh, this process. And we also really would like to get some idea. Where are these numbers, right, in these wide, wide ranges of costs and uh, energy footprints? Uh, we'd really like to have some idea of uh, where these systems can operate. So I have developed the first uh, order model. It is uh, essentially complete. We're calling it the TELSIM for the Techno-Economic Lifecycle Inventory Model. We've elected to implement this model in Microsoft Excel. Uh, Excel is a very accessible tool. Most technical professionals are quite comfortable working in that environment. And it has some features that really worked to my advantage as I was developing the tool. Um, you can drop graphics and text and uh, pretty much anything you want right into the spreadsheets where the calculations are uh, delivered. Um, it allows me to put uh, background information and explanatory information right embedded in the calculation blocks where uh, the, the hard work is being done. And also, because there are separate worksheets, reference materials or derivations of particular uh, equations or approaches to aspects of the process can be described without cluttering the actual workspace of the model. So for the next couple slides, I just want to introduce you to the architecture of the model. How, does, how do the computations flow? At the heart of this TELSIM is the process model. Right? So what, mo what process for making microalgal biofuels are we attempting to describe? We describe that process by use of conservation laws, material and energy balances, and performance equations that describe how the unit operations that comprise the model behave. Uh, with user inputs, which is primarily the amount of carbon to be converted and other uh, system parameters, physical and chemical properties, the algal strain and the nutrients that I'm going to use and other user inputs, the process model will predict <coughs> material and energy inputs and outputs. So it's basically a flow sheeting program that tells us how much nutrients we need, how much carbon will be emitted, so on and so forth. And from that will uh, be calculated what the direct energy use is inside the process and how much carbon is being emitted as a result of what's going on within the battery limits of the plant. The next layer of the model is the economic model, which basically uses straightforward cost accounting and capital cost scaling algorithms to estimate what the operating cost and capital cost for uh, this facility will be. <clears throat> Again, the user will input information here, such as unit prices for the raw materials. So I have a nitrogen source, I have a phosphorus source, I'm going to be buying ammonium nitrate and phosphate. Well, that would be the type of input that I would put in in order to figure out what that is. Capital cost, 
uh, as long as there is a basis plant, so I have a capital cost for a plant or a unit operation at a particular size, then we use simple scaling uh, algorithms uh, to calculate what those costs would be for a facility of a different size. And then finally, the third layer is the life cycle inventory model, which again uses simple emissions accounting and energy accounting practices to uh, estimate what the indirect energy uses are. And what I mean by that are the energy and carbon emissions associated with the raw materials and the capital equipment. So by accessing life cycle inventory databases offline, these are not part of the Telson model, but these are readily available, um, you would get emission factors and energy factors for different materials. So let's say I'm using urea as a source of nitrogen. This would tell me to make urea requires this much energy and generates this much carbon at the urea plant, right? And similarly, with this economic input-output life cycle assessment model uh, hosted by Carnegie Mellon University, um, I can probe this model with a given amount of capital investment or economic activity. And using data from the EPA and the Department of Commerce, what that does is predict the amount of carbon that would be emitted and the amount of energy that would be required for a given level of economic activity. So for example, I know that my plant will use a million dollars worth of steel pipe. I can probe this to say how much carbon is emitted when a million dollars worth of steel pipe is made. And it tells me that. And by aggregating these indirect emissions and carbon, uh, carbon emissions and energy uses with the direct within the pipe or uh, the plant battery limits, I get a total cradle to gate life cycle inventory of the energy required to make my algal biodiesel, as well as the carbon emissions associated with that. So again, that, that phrase, cradle to gate. The gate, the biodiesel leaves. I'm not concerned with what happens to it afterwards, but everything that happens upstream of that, including the transportation activities necessary to deliver those raw materials to the factory, are encompassed by this uh, model. OK, so that's the architecture of the overall computational tool. Let me tell you a little bit about the process model that's the basis for our calculations. Right? So this is this four-step process is the consensus model for how biofuels, in particular biodiesel, would be made using microalgae as our, uh, our production vehicle. Right? So you have four steps. You basically, you grow the algae. You harvest it from the aqueous medium in which it's grown. You extract the lipid fraction of the cells and then convert the lipid from uh, triacylglycerides to fatty acid methyl esters. Fatty, fatty acid methyl ester, esters, or FAME, is a, essentially a drop-in substitute for petrodiesel. Now, based on my experience in the food industry and uh, work done by other authors, I decided to add a fifth step to this fundamental process scheme, that being anaerobic digestion of the residual biomass. The oil content of algae typically runs in the range of, say, 25% plus minus. So in that case, 75% of the biomass is a byproduct, right? And we want to recover some value from that. And it could conceivably be sold off as a byproduct. A lot of people are proposing it would be a good animal feed. But for the purpose of our process, since the oil that's recovered is essentially pure hydrocarbon, all of the nitrogen and phosphorus that's embedded in the algae remains with the residual biomass. And through anaerobic digestion, we can recover a good uh, fraction of that and make it available for recycle back to the growth step, thereby lessening the amount that I need to buy in in the form of raw material. And the biogas that's generated in anaerobic digestion is a rich energy source, uh, which has real value uh, in our process. So I, being an engineer, I like to see pictures of things. I want to get a visual impression of what this is going to look like. So real quickly, I just want to give you a visual impression of what these processing steps are going to look like. Algae uh, would oftentimes be grown in large open ponds. These are called raceway ponds. You can tell from the configuration. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a, an algae farm with a number of ponds of different sizes. And on the right, you can see uh, two ponds, one full and one empty side by side. The empty pond gives you an idea of how shallow these are. 
It has to be real shallow because light is not going to penetrate very far, and these are photosynthetic organisms. Um, you can also see the paddle wheel mixer here, which is what causes a rotational flow in the channel, which stimulates mixing, keeps the nutrients being delivered to the cells, as well as keeps the cells uh, moving up to the surface where they can capture sunlight. But the harvesting step is probably going to look a lot like a conventional wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this would be an activated sludge type system with large circular clarifiers where the biomass is allowed to separate by gravity from the water. Um, another type of unit operation that I've looked at uh, is filtration. This is an example of a rotary drum filter uh, that could be used uh, for dewatering uh, the algal uh, suspension. Um, in addition to the dewatering activities, harvesting is also going to involve drying. Dewatering will only remove the extracellular water, but there's a lot of intracellular water as well. Uh, if you were able to remove all of the extracellular water, the remaining mass would still be upwards of 70-75% water by weight. And uh, depending on the type of extraction process, some of that will have to be removed, and that's done by drying. Uh, this is the type of equipment that you might expect to see with an oil extraction plant. It's going to look very much like what you would see in a large chemical manufacturing facility or a food processing plant. Similarly, the oil conversion, this is going to be a chemical operation. Uh, we're actually conducting chemical reactions that are catalyzed. So the types of equipment that you might expect to see will be large-scale chemical process equipment, including extractors, distillation towers, heat exchangers, and the like. Finally, the anaerobic digestion step, uh, what's envisioned are unlined lagoons covered with a plastic cover to capture the biogas, uh, to prevent it from escaping to the environment and providing that rich source of energy uh, that can be used in the process. So if you put it all together, this is an artist's rendering of what an algal biodiesel production facility might look like. Lots of ponds, right? because uh, you need a lot of surface area. This is a photosynthetic process, so we need exposure to sunlight in order for this to work. Uh, the ponds will surround centralized facilities where the harvesting, and extraction, and conversion of the lipid fraction uh, will occur. I have to ask, what's the purpose? I don't know. I'm wondering whether that's the lining that these guys are proposing to put in, or if that's the color of the particular algae strain that they... Oh, yeah. It's hematococcus. It's a purple bacteria or... No, it's it's, <laughs> Except that's more red than pink. It's, it's been infected somehow. <laughs> <clears throat> um, just as another aside, my personal feeling is that the ratio of ponds to centralized facilities will be much different. Yeah. Uh, there will be more of these centralized facilities than is shown here, simply because you're moving so much material back and forth that you're going to want to optimize the distance. And the model that I've looked at, the ratio of ponds to centralized facilities is roughly 100 to 1. Whereas I couldn't even begin to estimate is more like thousands to 1. Okay. Although there will be one centralized um, conversion plant. Right? And we'll talk about, about that a little bit later. So this is a little bit more robust, a little bit more complete flow sheet than the five block flow sheet that I showed before, showing all of the major material inputs and outputs. Um, you can see there are several recycle streams. A large percentage of the water that's recovered in dewatering the algal suspension will be recycled back to the growth step that will help moderate the amount of fresh water or input makeup water that has to be supplied to the system and uh, can help reduce cost as well as the burden of uh, large amounts of water required. You can also see the recycled nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus that's been recovered in the digestion step, also being recycled back to the growth stage. Now I've showed this one energy stream, uh, rest assured, there's energy inputs in all of these process steps. But because this particular recovered energy stream is so important, um, I, I also indicated that. Uh, I've shown it being used in the algal harvesting step but in essence, we're going to generate electricity and waste heat from that biogas, and we can use that anywhere in the process where we have a demand. But we know the demand is going to be high in the harvesting steps, so just uh, I've showed it being uh, recycled back there. <coughs> so, 
Um, I don't have time to go through all of the, the unit operations and the steps in the process, but I wanted to show a little bit of detail and the growth step, obviously a good place to start since the growth step and the size of the growth state really dictates all the downstream process, what it will look like. Here's a cutaway or a side view of one of the ponds. You see the major input and output streams, the nutrients that are being supplied uh, as required by the composition of the cells, the uh, flue gas, which is my source of carbon dioxide being pumped into the ponds, and the water streams uh, that make up the water balance, including rainfall and evaporation, which depending on the location of this thing can be really important, as well as the recycle streams that I mentioned before coming from the digestion step and from the dewatering step. What's important to note here is that the major energy users in the growth step are all associated with moving fluids around, right? We're either pumping water or we're pumping gas. And from a engineering calculation standpoint, uh, these are the types of calculations that would be used uh, to estimate what those power requirements are for the pond mixing energy. This is the uh, Manning equation for open channel flow, uh, flue gas pumping energy. This is an integrated form of the Bernoulli equation, and then uh, the Darcy equation for calculating uh, the power required for pumping water. So with these calculations, as long as I know the pressures involved and distances, that materials are being pumped, uh, we can determine how much energy is required uh, to accomplish those tasks. This is a real quick uh, flow chart of the growth step process model. Uh, so you can see that the first five calculation blocks are really dedicated to inputs from the user, what type of algae we're going to use, what we will use as our raw materials, our source of nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, etc., how much carbon we want to be converting, and then some other uh, physical and chemical property data. And then the uh, TELSIM will complete the water and material balances, again, reflecting that we need information from other parts of the process because of those recycle loops. And then the straightforward energy calculations associated with the movement of the fluids I was mentioning before. Uh, this is the framework for the conversion step financial model. All five steps, the financial models are pretty similar. Uh, the user is entering a lot of information, the size of his basis plant, uh, factors to account for inflation, factors to account for different sizes, uh, and what the capital <coughs> cost structure of the basis plant is. And then with the factors, the emission factors and energy factors that I talked about before coming from these external databases, the TELSIM will then calculate what the capital cost of the plant that I'm actually modeling in TELSIM is and what the annual operating costs are. Uh, there is a connection between these two because we are able to um, account for depreciation expense based on the size of the capital cost of the facility. Uh, the life cycle inventory model, similarly, uh, I've, I've shown the one for the harvesting step, but again, they're very similar for all five of the process steps. But basically, the user is bringing in emission factors, energy and water use factors for the various inputs, such as electricity, natural gas, uh, raw materials, and then uh, transport modes and distances so we can figure out what the carbon emissions and energy consumptions are associated with delivering our materials. Um, once all those factors are in, capital is allocated to different capital cost categories so I can probe that EIO model uh, based on whether I'm spending on concrete, steel, plastic, or whatever. Uh, the model will then um, determine based on the size of different streams and the financial breakdown what the total greenhouse gas emissions, energy, and water uses are for this particular plant. So as the model was being developed, um, I was populating it with values that I obtained from the literature. I have not generated any data experimentally. So this has all been sourced from uh, the open literature, either peer-reviewed uh, journal articles or government reports, typically Department of Energy reports. Um, it's come from many, many sources. This is not one coherent data set that I was able to populate the model with. So naturally, that makes me a little bit apprehensive. But I, was, I tried to be very judicious in my selection of the values that I used to populate the model so that they were realistic. 
right? So that the output that I was getting, I could at least evaluate whether it, it's, it's sensible or not. Um, but the real purpose of creating this test scenario, so because I'm, I'm using data from multiple sources, I can't call this a case study, right? Because it doesn't represent a single case. So that's why I call it the test scenario. The purpose really was, was to <coughs> populate the model in a way that would allow me to determine whether or not the model really is functioning the way it's supposed to and that the, you know, there's integrity in the numbers. Uh, so I, I just caution that I'm going to show some output values that I obtained from the test scenario. Uh, please realize that these are indicative only. They don't represent a particular case for a particular process in a particular location necessarily. Um, there, the model requires a lot of data input, whether it's process data, financial data, environmental data. Uh, what I've shown here are some of the key input parameters uh, that are necessary to drive the model. Um, what I've shown in the right-hand column are the values that I actually populated the model with. But in the center column here, just to give you an idea of the range of values that the model can accommodate to show you how flexible or how open uh, it is, uh, but uh, for the purpose of running a case, um, I used the flue gas that one might expect from a conventional coal-fired power plant, a common uh, chlorella strain in terms of chemical composition, readily available nutrients that would be used as nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur sources, and other values that are typical for this type of system that one would find in the literature. Since the system can accept sewage as part of the water balance. <clears throat> I have included 100 million gallons per day assumed uh, uh, sewage, treated sewage, not raw sewage, but treated sewage. But there's still enough residual and phosphorus in treated sewage to make it worthwhile to use that in place of makeup water. So when I run the model with that input and all the other inputs uh, that I've used, these, this is the sort of output that I got. So my basis plant, a one gigawatt coal-fired power plant, in order to process the carbon dioxide coming from that plant, and of course, only during daylight hours. Photosynthesis shuts down at night, right? But in order to process the CO2 during the day, assume the 12-hour uh, uh, day, um, over 3,900 ponds of four hectares each are required to process that amount of carbon dioxide. The total pond area, 162 million square meters. When you ratio up from the pond surface area to the total facility footprint, it's about a 1.25 multiplier to account for other process equipment, roads, pipe bridges, et cetera, et cetera. You're looking at a facility that's uh, roughly 200 square kilometers, or in units we might be a little more comfortable with, 80, roughly 80 square miles. All right? So think of a square nine miles on a side. That's the amount of surface area that would be necessary to produce biofuel using the carbon from this one gigawatt, which admittedly is a fairly large plant. But new plants that are going in today, that's the kind of size uh, that one might expect. Interestingly, the production is 3,920 metric tons per day, or just coincidentally, roughly one metric ton of algae per pond per day. And the amount of biodiesel produced, 890 metric tons per day, or roughly 2,000 gallons per acre per year. The reason I put that in this unit is because this is the unit of measure that's typically used for oil plants. And the value that you would see for things like uh, sunflower, canola, soy oil is in the range of 100 to 200, right? So clearly producing algae is more productive in terms of the land area required to produce it compared to most conventional oil plants. Now, I, I have been told that palm oil has much higher productivity and could actually come close to this same level of productivity. Um, the amount of water that a system like this requires, it can be enormous. Now, admittedly, this is based on a location in the Imperial Valley of California, which is just north of the Mexican border, so the Salton Sea area, where in fact some people are growing algae commercially already. Um, the evaporation rate in this particular part of California is enormous, so the loss of water in the system is on the order of 230 million gallons per day, and the total makeup, including the 100 million gallons per day, 
of treated sewage is over 330 million gallons of water per day. So you can imagine the stress that that's going to put on local water resources, whatever they are, even if they're impaired water resources. To consume a third of a billion gallons of water a day is going to put tremendous pressure on whatever the water source is. Now, the uh, TELSIM has been programmed to generate a lot of graphs and charts with the output data. I'm going to flash through a, a few of them for you real quickly here just to give you an idea of the sort of output that, uh, that you can get. Uh, this is a breakdown of the facility capital cost, the estimated total capital cost for this plant, $4.4 billion. And you can see how it breaks out between the five different processing steps. At this scale, it's so large, the contribution of the extraction and conversion steps to the overall capital cost is, is very low. That's because we only need one centralized extraction and conversion plant. <coughs> Um, and that will scale as chemical plants typically scale with an exponent factor of, say, 0.6, whereas the ponds and other processing equipment are essentially going to scale linearly with volume, right? If I add another demand for more algal biofuel, I'm going to need that many more ponds. So you can see why these things absolutely dominate the capital cost structure uh, is because of that linear scaling with volume. Uh, as far as annual operating costs, uh, again, the system will predict what the annual operating costs are for each of the five major process steps. The total cost is around $900 million per year. Uh, you can see the value of having the digestion step. Digestion step reduces the overall cost by almost $200 million per year, and that's by virtue of the avoided nitrogen and phosphorus sources uh, because I've reduced them through recycle and the value of the energy that I've obtained from the biogas, which displaces purchased natural gas and electricity. You can see where the big energy demands are, or the big cost demands, I'm sorry, are in the harvesting step and the growth step. A lot of the growth step cost is related to raw materials, and here is related to the energy associated with drying. Is the water cost in the growth? I don't even think I included a water cost, only the pumping costs. I didn't, I assume that water could be obtained at no cost for the purpose of this first pass. That's probably not right. It's probably <laughs> not correct. <laughs> but that would be something that would simply sure lay. And you can pump it in from yeah, or you have access to a degraded aquifer mm -hmm. or something. Uh, I shouldn't even call it an aquifer. Uh, a reservoir of saline water or something like that. A little salt and sea. But there would still be pumping costs, right? Wow. And those are included. Um, the other thing I would just like to point out, when you divide this total annual cost by the uh, amount of biodiesel produced, this is what you would get for a unit cost to produce the biodiesel on the order of about $10 a gallon. And again, these are just indicative values, um, not competitive with current petroleum fuels, but not so expensive that you would say, oh my god, this is ridiculous, I don't even want to think about it any further, right? Being off by a half an order of magnitude, that's within the realm of saying, hey, maybe we can make this thing work, right, with some some breakthroughs and some improvements. Well, the real issue is petroleum fuel is too cheap. It's another way to look at it, but you're absolutely <laughs> correct, and that is what has fueled our addiction. Uh, here's how the energy breaks out between the different processing steps, our five steps, um, and again showing the total net energy. And since this is positive, this is an energy input. The negative numbers here from the digestion sh step show the amount of energy in megawatts, actually I should say power, that we have saved um, by virtue of recovering the biogas and avoiding the manufacture of raw materials, which can involve, particularly nitrogen sources, involve a lot of energy to make uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Um, what's also see here is that I distinguish between the direct energy uses and the indirect energy uses. And I'll just remind you that the direct energy uses are the things that are occurring inside the plant battery limits, and the indirect are the things that are occurring outside, right? So this is my raw material production and the production of the capital equipment from which the plant is manufactured. And what you can see is that those indirect 
are actually fairly substantial, right? They're not negligible, certainly more than 10% of the total. So I thought it was um, worthwhile to have gone through all the extra effort to account for those things. And those indirects, I think, will become a bigger percentage as the size of the facility goes down, right? So depending on what the scale of the facility is, this could really be quite significant and quite important. The other interesting thing to see from this is that the digestion step essentially cuts the energy demand or the energy required in half, right? If I didn't have the digestion step at 775, this would essentially be doubled, right? So this, this really is doing yeoman's work in reducing the overall energy footprint of the entire facility. Um, the harvest but is what kills you, isn't it? It is, and you, you look at that, um, one gigawatt coal-fired power plant, I'm actually using more than one gigawatt of energy in the harvesting step. Now, I can't compare electrical energy to chemical energy. When you think about that one gigawatt coal-fired power plant probably took in three to four gigawatts of chemical energy in the form of coal, with most coal-fired power plants having an efficiency around 30%. Right? But nonetheless, the magnitude of this is just ginormous, right? And most of that is in the form of natural gas, but um, we are offsetting a very large percentage of that with the biogas, right? So again, if this wasn't here, um, this would look substantially worse. And again, I wanted to remind you, remember what our threshold value for net energy return, value of one, anything less than one, we're putting more energy in than we're getting out. So in essence, uh, since we're just below 0.5, we're using roughly twice as much energy to produce this fuel as the fuel itself contains, right? So clearly I could not take the fuel off the back end and burn part of it to generate the energy that I need to run the process because there just ain't enough of it. And if I want this to truly be a, a renewable fuel, then I've got to either figure out a way to get this value back up above one or whatever I'm going to use as my source of energy to make this fuel will itself have to be a renewable fuel. And that's going to be quite challenging based on the scale of uh, these facilities. Uh, here's a, an inventory of where the carbon dioxide emissions are coming from. As you might expect, in the growth step, we're actually sucking up a tremendous amount of carbon. In fact, the amount of carbon absorbed and converted to biomass is on the order of 8,000. But the 5,000 is the net after I have accounted for the energy demand and the consumptions in the growth step itself. Okay? So the fact that I'm pumping all these fluids around and I'm burning something to generate the electricity with which I'm running my pumps is what suppresses that value. The big carbon emissions is coming again in the harvesting step, and that's just a direct consequence of the big energy demand. And even though I'm using natural gas, uh, which is about the cleanest fossil fuel I can find, uh, I still have a very, very significant carbon dioxide burden. Interestingly, again, just like with the cost structure, the extraction and conversion is essentially meaningless in terms of the overall impact. So if I was interested in optimizing and improving this process, I would certainly not be worried about how do I extract and convert the oil, except to the extent that the extraction dictates what the water content of the algae is, right? And for conventional uh, vegetable oil processing, the maximum water content that can be accepted <coughs> into conventional hexane extraction is 10%. And that's the problem, is taking the algae, which is coming out of the ponds at uh, like 30, uh, 30 grams per liter or whatever, and bringing it up to 90% dry solids basis, is why this energy demand is so significant. Is that a centrifuge step that's used there, or what's the... That, that would be a dewatering. The dewatering? But that's, the har that's not the harvest? It is, yeah. but that, that only gets the extracellular water. It's the intracellular water where you have to rely on diffusion right. to get that water out, right? And that's, what is that's the, what's driving this big, big energy burden here. If that number could be relaxed, and in fact, that's I'm looking at right now, is what would it take to relax that 10% limit on water content in the algal biomass going to extraction? See, what I'm worried about is that you're going to have to get that water out somewhere, somehow. And all I may be doing is playing a shell game, right? right. 
I may be moving it from here to here, right, unless there's something fundamentally different about the technology. Overall, add it up, and what we have is that uh, we are actually emitting carbon. Right? So this is not carbon neutral. It's not carbon positive. It's carbon negative. Right? So we have a net carbon dioxide emission from producing the fuel. And I haven't even accounted for the carbon emitted when I burn the fuel. So I assume that that's going to be a, a, a roughly even trade with petrofuel. Right? So the amount of carbon I would emit to the atmosphere of burning this fuel is essentially going to be the same as burning an equivalent amount of petrodiesel. So uh, that describes the model, some of the output that we're getting from the model, some of the implications of what we're finding from our test scenario and where we think we need to focus. As I mentioned, the extraction step is really important. So future work, we're beginning to frame some case studies that we want to run uh, where we would have coherent data sets reflective of a single location. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is there is a trade association uh, called the National Association for Advanced Biofuels and Bioproducts, or NAB, which is strongly promoting the development of algal biofuels. And they have published a set of goals or targets um, for R&D in this area. And what we want to do is uh, apply those goals in the model to see what difference they would make. Right? So even if these goals are achieved, what would that do to the carbon footprint, the price, and all the other things? The other thing is that I, I, I think some of these might be uh, really difficult to achieve. Uh, less than 0.75 gallons of water per gallon of biodiesel, based on our Southern California case, we're around 2,000 gallons of water per gallon of biodiesel. <clears throat> there may not be a place in the United States where this could be achieved in an open system. So you're almost by default have to run a closed system or a photobioreactor to achieve that. And that would be really interesting to know. 10% right? um, of fuel energy content. Right? So instead of an NER of you know, 0.47, we're looking at an NER of about 9. Right? So again, a very substantial um, improvement. And I'm not quite sure how this would be achieved. So some of these are clearly inputs to the model. Some of these are outputs. Right? So I'm not quite sure exactly what we're going to be able to parameterize versus what we're simply going to have to accept as an output of the input parameters that we've chosen. There's been some really interesting work on the viability of algal biodiesel production going on at the Pacific Northwest National Lab under uh, Dr. Mark Wigmosta. And uh, what I've shown here are a couple of maps of the contiguous 48 states of the United States where his team has run uh, some using geospatial uh, data, weather data. Um, they have predicted what the productivity of an open algal system would be uh, based on the weather and uh, uh, surface data. In other words, the slope of the land and the suitability and so forth, with the highest productivity being in red and the lowest productivity being in purple. Right? Over here, what they have done is looked at the annual water, predicted water consumption for the production per gallon of oil produced. Right? And again, with purple being the lowest water consumption and red being the highest. And the results are a little bit surprising. Whereas most people seem to think that the best place to grow algae is in the southwestern part of the United States, in fact, that is not the best, even from a productivity standpoint, but you would absolutely be killed on a water basis. And that's what we were seeing. <coughs> so what you want is you want purples and reds over here, and I, I'm sorry, you want red over here and purple over here. And if you just do a quick visual comparison, it actually looks like Florida might be the best place to go. The Everglades. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but northern Florida and the Florida Panhandle looks like it might be among the most um, promising locations in the continental United States. Uh, and so we want to look at perhaps modeling a site in that location. Um, now, th that's applying the model clearly. Uh, there are lots of opportunities to make improvements within the model itself. Uh, 
We have some rather simplistic uh, biophysical models for heat and mass transfer in the ponds and for the microalgae growth. I do have a very simplistic photosynthetic model based on the amount of incident photosynthetically active radiation and certain assumptions about yields, how much algae you can grow. And that's essentially what McWosta put into his model. It, it, it agrees not too badly, uh, surprisingly well, but I'm sure with Bob's help I could, I could make that better. Um, I have assumed a certain process flow sheet for making uh, algal biodiesel, but there are a lot of ways to skin this cat, and uh, I could add more options for different ways of processing the material so that a user could uh, construct a variety of different processing schemes to see how uh, they would perform. And there's a lot of really interesting suggestions about how to grow the algae, some of which I think are a little counterintuitive, but as I mentioned, photobioreactors, um, closed systems to avoid evaporation, but it introduces a lot of other problems, and not the least of which is these are very expensive compared to digging you know, big pits in the ground. Some people are proposing to grow algae uh, heterotrophically in fermenters using sugar as a substrate, glucose. Again, I have some concerns about that because now I've added a whole other set of processing. Uh, I have to grow a crop, whether it's sugar cane, sugar beets, or corn. I have to extract and recover the sugar and then feed it again to another biological process. It's hard for me to imagine how that would be better than what we're doing with the, the model, but it's worth exploring. As our um, some interesting uh, temporal feeding systems to try to promote lipid content. It has been found that uh, lipid production will go up when the cells are starved of nitrogen, but what I'm also finding is that that can often be at the expense of cell growth, right? So I'm basically converting some of the biomass uh, from uh, things like saccharides, polysaccharides, to lipid, but I haven't really produced anything more. But a lot of really interesting ways uh, that we can go with the model. So uh, with that, I would like to wrap up by acknowledging my sponsors. This work is being co-funded by Monsanto and ADM. They've been really, really great partners to work with. And then uh, my thesis advisor, Jay Turner, and co-advisor, Rich Axelbaum uh, in EECE. Uh, the other members of my thesis committee Madri, uh, Dave Gustafson from Monsanto, and Bob. I uh, really want to thank them for their guidance and input and support for the project. So I know I've run a little long, but I'd be happy to take any questions at this point. <coughs> Shandor. Uh, the algae productivity value that you used for your simulation? Was, was it based on a work that used flue gas as the input, or it was based on a work that used some other gas? Uh, not sure. Because I guess if I use flue gas and the productivity goes very low, right. then it's going to change the whole right. thing. Absolutely. It, it goes up as long as yeah, I would think it go the as long as, it's, as long as the <clears throat> you know flue gas is scrubbed and everything, and you're not killing. Them. But, right, with um, acidity or other contaminants. Yeah, but, but algae are really happy with 5% CO2 and, and they grow a lot faster. So that's, that's all good. So the, the value, I believe, I, I, I'm saying I'm not sure, I've I got to go back and confirm, but I believe it was supplemented with carbon dioxide, but at what concentration or what amount, I don't know. What we assumed for the purpose of a very simplistic model is that uh, the uptake um, is uh, 75%. Right? So with a more sophisticated mass transfer model, we could determine that more uh, precisely, but uh, at this level, we're simply including that as a user-defined factor. Right? How much of the CO2 that I'm feeding is actually converted into biomass, and how much is released to the atmosphere. So that actually gets to one of my follow-up questions, which I guess I now get to ask first, which is, um, it looks like you're feeding um, gas to an open system, what prevents the gas simply from escaping, but you just addressed that with right. that parameter. So, you know, solubility of CO2 in water is, is pretty good, and uh, they, uh, the flue gas is fed at the bottom of the pond, um, it's through spargers, and uh, it's going to bubble up, and, you know, with ammonia or other 
counter ions, uh, I think the solubility would be fairly high. But again, that would be something that would be really neat to include in the model. Uh, but it's going to be a, uh, fairly complicated depending on what other stuff is in there. So maybe just another basic question for those of us that are engineers and not biologists first. Why can't you just put a cover on top of these ponds to prevent water from evaporating? Cost? Heat? Heat transfer. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, the you're relying on evaporation. Yeah, you're you really are relying on evaporation for temperature control. Okay. Right. So if you confine this system, you've got all this incident radiation, very little, very uh, small amount of which is being actually converted into chemical energy. The rest is degraded into heat. Right. So you are actually relying on evaporation for uh, right for cooling. Bioreactors, you have to cool them. Right. Uh, photobioreactors, <laughs> temperature control is quite, quite problematic, as is gas exchange. And that would be the next problem. How do I get rid of the oxygen that is being expelled by the cells as they are metabolizing CO2? And oxygen will become toxic if you can't get it out. So if I have closed photobioreactor systems, what you'll find is that at the end of each segment of reactor, they have little gas exchange systems where they introduce CO2 and, and sparge out the oxygen. So that would be another reason. Third, I think, is fouling. And you will begin to get cloudy, uh, uh, and then your light penetration through the plastic is going to be attenuated, and your productivity is going to be uh, impaired. Okay. And if you give me more time, I'll <laughs> think of another reason. But I like to think of things in threes. I have a simple question, just because I'm unfamiliar. But with the raceway ponds, do they continually harvest, or do they harvest it all at once? It, yeah. Is oh, there multiple options? There are multiple options. And I think um, you have so many factors that you have to concern yourself with, not the least of which is invasion by wild types with parasites and predators and other things. So what I think might be a very viable uh, arrangement is to have closed uh, inoculators, essentially. So I'm going to grow an inoculum in a closed system and then seed the ponds from time to time. I will figure out what the maximum run time, and then I will harvest continually until I can't do it anymore, dump the system, clean it, and then restart. So it's going to be kind of like a semi-batch or uh, not a truly continuous fermentation. Ursula? So this thing about the nitrogen starvation, so um, I don't know of any algae that make any significant amount of uh, tag as long as they have good nitrogen. So you're pretty much stuck unless you find the magic algae that I don't know exists mm -hmm. yet, or you engineer, uh, with letting them grow as much as they can, and then they will use up the nitrogen uh, anyway and start making their tag at that point. So the nitrogen starvation isn't uh, a bug, it's a feature. Um, you, you pretty much have to do it. You have to do it. Huh? You have to do so, it because that's the way the cells metabolism is set up. Right. So they, they make the stuff, uh, they don't make it when they're growing. Yeah. So taking stuff out while they're growing uh, isn't, is not a viable, uh, isn't going to work yeah. unless you have an algorithm that I don't no, no. So, no. So now we're getting into some real sequential processing, and it reminds yeah. me of sequence well, that, that reactors. I don't think that's a problem. No, it's just, it's just, it's just, you it's just a little bit more. That you wait until it, yep. that, that was fat, you harvest the whole thing, and right. meanwhile, the pond next door, you're in So right. it's right. it's not a problem. I think it's, it's actually a feature. Right. So it becomes kind of a sequential batch right. system exactly. where different uh, ponds are in different stages Absolutely. of the cycle. Right. So it's just an engineering management uh, issue. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can figure that out. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll have to figure out how to model that. Because uh, well, no, this is a, a steady state. This, you know, yeah, we're basically state. using global values that represent the time averaged over, you know, long periods of time. But a, a, real, a real, speaking again as a biologist, one of the things that I don't think nearly enough attention is being paid to is getting the algae to uh, grow to high density before they quit. So Absolutely. The that would cells be... per mil thing is, and then the other thing is in cells per mil, um, I haven't, I think that a lot of more thinking needs to be done about why you need so much body of water. 
because each one of these cells is 10 microns, and you know there's huge amounts of water between each cell, and uh, to figure out, you know, find algae that can grow with less water would obviously make no authority. Yes, it would address a lot of the energy associated with moving fluids around. Right, exactly. Right, so that's a big piece of the energy pie. Yeah. Uh, if you could get to that. Yeah. So growing them on surfaces or something like that is something I keep saying to the engineers. Uh, again, um, um, you know, it's <laughs> interesting. There's a guy in California, and I know you were at the same conference I was at last summer. Uh, John Benjamin is his name, and he's been working on algal fuels for decades. And I had a conversation with him, and what he said when I asked him about photobioreactors was something to the effect that with an open pond system, if you had to line the ponds, it would no longer be even close to financially feasible. Okay, so you know to get from just putting plastic liners on the ponds to having growing all the algae on films or having you know plastic bags that you're growing algae and all these really neat systems that you see photographs of in miniature, right? On a, on this kind of scale, I mean four four and a half billion dollars is a big enough number, but multiply that by three or four. Um, I think is what you're talking about. So. Right. It has to be something. Yeah, it's got to be. It's got to be cheap. I mean, cheap, cheap, cheap. Because we are talking about a commodity product here, right? Fuel is a commodity, and we can't pay specialty chemical prices. Well, we could. And I'll tell you one thing: we sure use a hell of a lot less energy if we were paying specialty chemical prices for uh, fuel. I was fascinated by the comparison of wood pellets to coal. Um, coal that uh, Kansas City Power and Light is buying in from Wyoming is around $10 a ton. $10 a ton for coal. Okay. It's practically free. Right? Yeah. So, so more to ship it then. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, it's, it's, it's... Well, that's $10 a ton including the shipping, right? I, I'm not sure if that was the delivered price or whatever, but yeah. it no, doesn't I mean, much matter, it. does it? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, if, if <laughs> it must rail is a done. very inexpensive way to yeah, to yeah, deliver well, freight, it is it's <clears throat> pennies per ton. Probably seems like the, the, I come back to this: the big place where you can crack this is with the harvesting, yeah. and <clears throat> just have to really think of ways to somehow solve that problem. Mm -hmm. That would have a huge impact right. on the on the economy. As well as the carbon footprint and the energy footprint, right? So by attacking that one thing, you improve all of the the really critical performance metrics uh, for this process. But what that does is that focuses people on what they need to work on, right. in a sense. And they, you know, like you said, the extraction and so on. Those are all small parts, the small overall pie, right. small fry. Unless you can figure out how to extract with more water, probably. right? Without it. Destroying your your desired product. I, I I'm really spending a lot of time right now trying to figure out what are the consequences of allowing more water, and uh, it's it's a little bit hard to tweeze out, but um, it could be because you end up extracting more polar compounds. It could be because you get stable emulsions in your hexane solvent. Uh, it could be a lot of different problems, but the range, the tolerable range for water in the meal that goes into vegetable oil extraction is very narrow. It's like 9 to 11 percent. It's 10 plus or minus 1, and that's it. Right? So there's something, there's some sensitivity there to that uh, value that uh, I haven't quite figured out yet. But when I do, that, that'll be very... When well, people talk about this milking idea, I yeah. that I asked you before, where you get the algae to excrete it themselves, and then you just go skim it off the surface every morning. Harvesting your eggs. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, again, but, from uh, I've also heard people just laugh at that, say that it's completely ridiculous, that it'll be too volatile, you'll lose it all during the, and, and so on. Well, tag is volatile. Well, tag is volatile. But, but, if, but <laughs> if you get it to make like oh, isotonoids oh, yeah, or yeah, something yeah, yeah. like that, no, 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 no. then you're going to lose that's it. What they uh, right. yeah. And any bug that's there. And any bug, yeah, that was the other thing, that any bug yeah. in the world will just. Oh, a while. Absolutely. Right. And so, and then you know, it's a nice a, idea, but it may not really be practical. And and from a uh, engineering standpoint, you really are going to need to switch it on and off, right? 
You can't have that happening all the time. Because right? what's going to happen to mass transfer, light penetration, and all those things if I have this you know, film sitting on top of my, uh, my growth medium all the time? So right. you want to flip the switch and then have all yeah, the discord and all that stuff. Keep the stuff out, up and that's right? it. <laughs> and then assuming the cells are still viable, I recycle them back to the growth stage. right? But I, I have a hard time, again, from an engineering standpoint, a lot of this you know, conceptually sounds really great, but how do I make it work, particularly at this kind of scale? And with these sorts of cost structures, right? I can't, I can't afford to put any more cost into this because I'm already 10 times as expensive as so I need to. So there are at present two microalgae, nanoparoxys and clamidomonas, that you can get so fast that they float. Uh-huh. And, and this depends um, on... And, and the, they haven't secreted it, but they're, they're, the amount of water in the cell is way, way less. Way, way um, down. From, yeah. Right. Um, so, you know, a lot of work can be done at the outlet. Right. Um, to help your numbers there. Right. Uh, and yeah. it's, it's nice to see the harvesting is such a big problem, because that's what we're working on. Good, good. <laughs> so relying on the biologists to solve some of these problems for us. Is it a solvent extraction for getting the TAG out of the cells? It is a solvent extraction to remove the lipid. And uh, yeah, so you say then you need another distillation column? That is correct. In fact, there's multiple uh, recovery steps uh, on the, uh, what they call micella, right, which is the mixture of oil and solvent. Right? Uh, you have to prepare the solid material to essentially make, to maximize the surface area, because you are doing a liquid solid extraction, right? so you want to maximize that. So the solids are made into what they call colettes, which is like Cheetos. You think about it, it's puffed. It's literally puffed, right? So you get a web type structure, which allows maximum solvent penetration, maximizes the solid surface area for the solvent to be able to get at the lipids. But then once you form this micella, then you distill off the hexane, uh, but then there's a water hexane separation that has to occur. So you have multiple separations downstream uh, before you can then even recycle the hexane back. So and even with all of that said, that cost is pretty minor, right, compared to some of these other costs, which is largely uh, attributable to the energy. This is a really energy intensive process. Well, anything that involves water. It's typically pretty energy intensive. Isn't the stuff that comes out of the ground, that has a lot of water too. They do, but uh, oftentimes you can separate those quite sim quite easily with, with just chemicals. Uh, oil, water, emulsion breakers. Okay. Um, but they're accustomed to, to doing that. Yeah. In fact, Petrolite, the company that I worked for in between, uh, that was their business. They invented the chemicals that are used to separate oil and water. Uh, the stories, the legends are that back in the California oil boom days, um, the crude that came out of the ground with a lot of water, they just put it in big impoundments and leave it there. And it might take a week, it might take a month for that emulsion to break, but digging big, pan, you know, big ponds of oil, I guess, back 100 years ago was <laughs> perfectly cool. Not, any, not anymore. <laughs>